For those of you who don't no. know, Steve, uh, we probably know each other about 1972 or three. A long time. A long time, yes. So you started out, you went to high school in? Yeah, I went to high school uh, in Bergen County, a, a small town called Bergenfield. Okay. And Anybody graduated. from Bergenfield here? Oh, okay. <laughs> and did you have in uh, did you have any inclination in high school that you were like yeah, you I want was to be a, in the uh, entertainment I, business? I was a uh, sousaphone player, and right. they were, and the, the Bergenfield band was one of the uh, premier bands in New Jersey, and uh, we were uh, given the uh, <clears throat> the uh, lead role every year in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. We, ah. we were the band, and we got. I somehow, I don't know what happened, I had these R.H. Macy cufflinks. Oh, good. Um, and this was the day when the innovation was um, fiberglass instruments. So instead of having these sore shoulders from carrying a, a sousaphone in a parade, they gave us these light, white. The, the white fiberglass yeah, ones. Right. That, um, didn't they were have. good for cold weather, too, because they didn't get as cold as the metal. Yeah, I don't think they sounded as... Wow. Anyway. So um, I was pretty miserable at that. Um, not a very good uh, player, and, and my fingers just didn't seem to work very well on the valves, nor did they ever work well on a guitar. <laughs> so I realized that that wasn't going to be my expertise, so um, I still had some interest in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to undergrad school in Washington, D.C. at American University. So in high school, you had no interest in the music business, really. You didn't want to... You didn't know. I mean, you weren't reading Billboard. You weren't. You know, funny enough, uh, if I go back and look at, I can't believe this, my high school newspaper, they have predictions and they had me listed as a sports announcer, a oh. radio sports announcer. You so went I to have, the right place for your master's well, anyway. Well, but I have, no, I have no knowledge of sports, so it seemed, anyway, right. it's interesting. Okay. So you decided to go to American University? Well, they decided to accept me. Okay. <laughs> So you went to American yeah, University and nothing about the music business or anything, just... Uh, well, um, I was such a sloth, I couldn't figure out my major, I think, until my junior year. And my faculty advisor said, you know, you better figure out what you can do for a major. So he was a creative guy, and he came up with a major for me. We invented at the time. Mm. Now it's not in invented, it's, a, it's a accepted a major. It was called American Studies. Mm -hmm. They took a lot of the classes I took and gave me some books to read and some independent study and some internships and <coughs> somehow they squeezed me through and got me out of there. But how I got involved was um, uh, in the, I was in a dorm and I had two roommates, one from Brooklyn and one from Pittsburgh. And the guy from Pittsburgh came with his girlfriend and on Friday nights they were getting busy and they put a tie on the door which meant do not disturb. So. I don't know what I was going to do. So I, I wandered over to campus radio station, and um, they needed somebody to read the news. Yes, they read the news. So back in the Stone Age, they had a device called a teletype, and you ripped it off the teletype, the mm -hmm. copy, you rewrote it, and you had to have a three or four minute newscast, I think every other hour on the hour on the campus radio station. So, you know, um, that was how I spent uh, initially my freshman weekends, and I sort of got the bug from that. Ah. So you got the bug to be in radio, you think? Yes. Ah. So you graduate with this make-believe degree, and then how did you wander to Syracuse Well, before, before I graduated, um, I was able to claw my way up the, the ladder and became um, a program director and then senior year station manager ah. um, at, the, at the campus radio station. Um, and I also, um, I worked, uh, I, got a, I got a job working for the Voice of America as a foreign language producer. Um, they had to have a U.S. citizen oversee these uh, broadcasts of propaganda that was sent overseas at the time. And I needed a part-time job. And on the campus radio station bulletin board was an index card. It said, uh, production assistant needed, I love to forget this, acid rockers need not apply. <laughs> And it was for a famous New York disc jockey who had relocated to Washington, D.C. And so I did one of my first uh, illegal things. I, I took the card off the wall so no one else could. And I applied for the job. And uh, I got hired. Um, and I was working a couple of hours a day 
for this disc jockey in a uh, suburban radio station um, in Maryland. Um, so I had that job, and I had... Who was it? Are we not allowed to know? Oh, well, um, yeah. So um, in New York in the 60s, um, during the heydays of the Beatles, there was a New York disc jockey who became known as the Fifth Beatle because he befriended them. The guy's name was Murray the K. Mm -hmm. And um, he had decided to move down to D.C. Um, he had a girlfriend down there, and he was working at an adult contemporary radio station and then flying up to New York on the weekends doing network radio. Yes, there was network radio back then. Um, and so that's, mm. that's who I learned so my chops Murray from. Murray the K. Cool. That's a big deal. If, anybody Beatles fans here? Because that's, like, that's a very historical thing. When they first came here in February of 64, mm -hmm. Murray the K, was he on WMCA? No, W I N S. I N S was, yeah. was yeah. music back then. Yes. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. And his whole. You thing give us twenty minutes, twenty-one minutes, and we give you the Beatles. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, how did you meander to Syracuse? So, um, Murray left the adult contemporary station and went to work at a progressive rock FM station, um, and I went with him, and. Um, they hired me to do the overnights. So I was doing overnights from midnight to six, and um, I was making 60 some odd dollars a week. And I would um, get home at six in the morning, my roommates would be just getting up. Um, I was eating Roy Rogers fast food, and I couldn't sleep, and it was just, I, I was like, this is, this, I'm gonna get myself nuts here. This is not a good job, it's not a lot of money. Here I have a big graduate degree, undergraduate degree. And so I stayed in touch with my faculty advisor. Um, and I said, okay, now what the hell do I do? So he said, well, you should go to grad school. I go, you gotta be kidding. I just did four years of school. You want me? He goes, no, 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 this is, this is like three semesters. You get your master's degree. Um, it's one of the top journalism schools. You'd be great there. Um, it's probably a little late to apply, but why not? So, uh, I applied to uh, Syracuse to Newhouse, and uh, I guess this was in June or something. Anyway, they said, okay, uh, we'll put you on the waiting list. I don't know what that meant, but okay, I got on the waiting list. So here I am doing this radio thing, and um, I get a notice in the mail that you've been accepted. So I give my general manager a notification telling him that I've been accepted at sc uh, grad school. I'm, I'm leaving this job. And he goes, oh, no, we're going to make you a star here in Washington. <laughs> I said, yeah, 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 okay. I said, I'm just telling you, in the next five or six weeks, I'm out of here. Um, you should find a replacement. No, no, no. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I drove up to Syracuse and found a place to live um, and got myself organized and came back down. I said, okay, class has started this date. I'm just letting you know. Um, so I got accepted at Syracuse. And I do you know, pay props and respects to the faculty advisor who really took me under his wing and suggested this. So much so that last, I guess last fall, I tracked him down. Um, he had just been uh, thrown off a, a, a local liberal arts newspaper because he was such a liberal. Um, so he was watching a football game and I called him at home. He hadn't heard me for God knows how many years. Totally flipped him out. He was like, wow. I said, I just want to call you and say, here I am working today, and I owe a lot of it to you getting me on the right path. And uh, he was quite taken back by it. So Good. stay in touch with your old professors. You never know. Your former professors. Well, by then they'll be <laughs> old. <laughs> so Syracuse, you get the degree. So I, get, I was up at Syracuse. So again, the radio bug. So what did I do? So I, would became, I had my third class radio broadcast license, which was a big deal back in the Stone Age. You don't need it anymore. Um, but they needed somebody to. Um, run the uh, public service programming at the top 40 station and read the transmitter. So I, I did that for a couple of weeks and then realized like I was getting paid less than scale. So I said, screw this, this is no fun. And I got a job doing um, Sunday nights and signing off the station at a rock station in Utica. So I had to drive an hour away. Um, I did that and then I got hired as a campus rep uh, from a small record label that no longer exists called United Artists. And it was like 25 bucks a week and all the vinyl you could eat, and <laughs> running around the state of New York trying to c convince other college kids that these are cool records that people might like. And I think the only, the only record we had that really today means anything is the Electric Light Orchestra. But mm -hmm. it was a lot of ridiculous bands. Anyway, um, and then 
a friend of mine at, at then was CBS Records, now Sony, got me a job because she had to get on a list because of such a coveted position, working at the campus record store, which at the time was owned by CBS. It was a chain of, when they sold records, a chain called Discount Records. It was a big chain, mostly on um, campuses and in student populated areas, and I would work there a couple hours uh, a day. And uh, so I was totally immersed in that culture. And then I was the only undergrad that the undergrads would allow on the campus radio station for some strange reason, they thought I was okay because most of the grad students, they just were like, uh, <laughs> anyway, so, you know, so I, you know, somehow fit all that in um, as well as a bag boy at a grocery store um, and with my studies and stuff and um, got out of there um, with a degree in MS in television, radio, and film from uh, Newhouse. And that was what year? 73? Yeah, back in the Stone Age. Yeah, they had electricity back then, but yes. No, I'm talking yeah. because I think it was yeah. 73 that we yes. ran that first huge seminar up there in music business that Cy Leslie ran, and we brought in a different guest every week. And might, might have been. James but, uh, Taylor but I, but I was, and I was gone. Clive I was gone by, uh, by, the, by August. Yeah, it was spring of 73. Right. So you got another taste, actually, of the music business with that as well. Right. So... Your next job then, or your first real job, was at Atlantic? So I move home to scenic Bergenfield, and I need a job. Hmm. Oh, so Murray the K now is working full-time at WNBC Radio. Mm -hmm. um, he'd given up the DC thing, he was there full-time, so I was working for him part-time. And I had heard... Well, there's a couple of things happened concurrent. I heard that there might be some changes at Atlantic Records um, at that time. But I had an MS and TVR film, so I'm going to get a job. So I'm going to go to the Warner Music Building, Warner Communications Building at the time, and I'm going to go up to the Human Resources Department. I'm going to get a job in this new technology, cable TV, because they need a young whippersnapper like me. <laughs> so I'm in the elevator wearing my suit. And in walks the guy who ran the college radio department, Atlantic Records. And he starts laughing. He's like, what are you doing here in a suit? Because the last time he saw me, I'm wearing a tie-dyed shirt. I have a big fro. Mm -hmm. And uh, he brought one of his bands and we're uh, smoking something we shouldn't be. And um, <laughs> what are you doing? You know, like all of a sudden, I'm like Stevie Strait, you know. And I said, well, I'm going upstairs, you know, uh, cable TV. He goes, no, 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 you come off here. I, we may have something for you. So they pull me in a room, and I meet a couple of the muckety-mucks at Atlantic Records, and the interview goes like this. Kid, do you have a car? Yeah. Where do you live? I live at home in New Jersey. Do you know anybody at the radio station WNEW-FM? Yeah, I grew up listening to him on the radio. I actually have befriended one of the air personalities uh, from my college station. Yeah. You think you might be able to help us uh, get some of our music played there? Well... I did some little thing for this little label while I was in college, United Artists. Okay, kid. Um, uh, all right. So go to our branch office in Carlstadt, New Jersey, which was really a warehouse. We actually kept the records and shipped them to the stores back in the day. And I have to go out there, and I meet the guy, and they could care less. They don't care. They're sales guys. They want some kid walking in. Like, yeah, what do you want? Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You'd be good. Okay, fine. Go, right, go back. Call, call, so I call the head of promotion of this guy. And uh, I said, hi, uh, uh, Dick, it's uh, Steve. Steve. He goes, oh, and he goes into the speed rap about this Led Zeppelin record that they're working and how it's just not performing as the way they thought it should be. And I let him finish his rap, and I go, uh, it's uh, Steve Leeds. He thought I was Led Zeppelin's manager, a guy named Steve Weiss. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, it's Steve. He's a uh, kid, you got the job. You start Columbus Day, you're getting $250 a, a week. Well, my mother thought that was the worst thing that happened to me. She said, oh, my God, you're going to be so spoiled. Got an expense account, 250 a week. Anyway, so I was, <laughs> I was hired to be the local Atlantic rep in New York City to work New, New, New York, Connecticut, Southern Connecticut, Long Island, um, New Jersey, and get Atlantic Records played. At those days, Atlantic Records was a pretty hot little label. They had Led Zeppelin. They had the Rolling Stones. They had Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. They had Aretha Franklin. They had the Spinners. They had Bette Midler. They had all genres, Crosby, yes, Stills, and Nash. Foreigner. Right. Yeah. So, anyway, so 
that's where I started my illustrious uh, career. And you stayed there for five years. I was there for five years. Getting and to be they promoted national me. album promotion. Yeah, they promoted me up so again from local to national. And then um, they moved me to uh, a sister label, Atco. They were just starting that up. And I um, was mm -hmm. there for about a year. And I, I said, I got itchy, as I hope some of you do. Get itchy and go, I want to try an entrepreneurial thing. What about if I do what I'm doing now, but my, make myself available for other people? So was it like an independent promotion guy getting rock records played? And I would do the same territory I did for Atlantic. So at that time, it was Maine to Virginia. So people would hire me for $250, $300 a week to get their um, records played. And I guess the first person that hired me uh, was Rounder Records. They had a record um, by George Thorogood, Move It On Over. And so um, it was a big success, and all of a sudden, everybody's, the phone's ringing, people calling you up. Hey, can you do this? Because they think you have some sort of magic that you can, not realizing, you know, it's got to be it. It's got to mm -hmm. be a good piece of music. People got to like it. Anyway, so I, I, I grew that business, and I did that for about four and a half, five years. Um, and then... Uh, not married. No kids. No kids, no married. Married, just a lot of uh, bills and... Mm -hmm. Things to do and, and traveling. And you moved into the city. Um, yeah, I was living in the city. Okay. And the offices, I, I started working at a at a uh, Hall and Oates's management office. Then I worked at Stiff Records' offices. Um, at the time, they were also managing Pink Floyd and Graham Parker. And I wound up finally at an office on uh, West Fifty Sixth Street. Love the address two three four West Five Six. What I never knew until recently that office was the original home of Atlantic Records before it was called Atlantic, oh. right above Patsy's, the Italian restaurant, yeah, so it was right. always smelling from garlic and stuff. Um, <laughs> anyway, I did that for about five years, and then the government had their hearings, and they decided that uh, uh, outside services such as myself were, were not healthy business, and it was, it was called payola, and so all the record companies all of a sudden stopped using outside people such as myself. That was the first time. That was the first time, so <laughs> I remember you know, going from a healthy six-figure um, uh, revenue stream to all of a sudden, like, nobody wants to do, do business with you because you're one of those things they can't use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then you went and um, you were an associate producer. You did something with um, Bow well, Wow Wow. Well, so one of the projects I had when I was on my own um, was Joan Jett, and she... Uh, was had left the Runaways, recorded a record, it came out in Europe, but nobody wanted it in the States. And so the manager pressed up his own records and was selling them out of the trunk of his car, and she was doing gigs. And um, after I Love Rock and Roll became this huge hit, he was a successful producer. I feel love in the air. <laughs> so yes, he was a successful producer. So convinced him that um, he had been approached by um, Malcolm McLaren to uh, work with Bow Wow Wow. They had a record out in England. Uh, this was when home taping was going to kill music. It was C60, C30, C90 was the song. Anyway, they thought they could maybe have a bigger hit in the States or be more successful. The lead singer was Annabella. She was like 16 years old. Um, their drummer was from Adam and the Ants. Mm -hmm. Anyway, convinced him to do this. So he's down in Florida, and he's going to Criteria Studios down there. And he calls me up. He goes, OK, wise guy, they don't have a single song. This band has no material. He says, what are we going to do? It was your idea to get me to produce them. So, so, well, you know, they got that. One thing I know about Bow Wow Wow at the time, they had this big jungle drum sound, boom, 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 you know, like Bo Diddley. I said, you know, there's this record by the Strange Loves called I Want Candy. It really wasn't a big hit, and it was done by a bunch of guys from Brooklyn, but they claimed to be Aborigines. But anyway, it was never a hit. But I, I don't know, my brother and I used to listen to it. We thought it was a pretty cool little record. He goes, yeah, I don't know anything about that. So I make a cassette. Yes, it was a cassette, and overnight it to him. And he says, all right, get your ass down here. So they go into Criteria Studios, and they cover that song, and then they do a couple of originals, and they put out an EP on RCA, and I'm sure most of you have heard I Want Candy, and that's how that record came. So I, they gave me an associate producer credit, 
And I'm happy to say last year I actually got a couple of dollars royalties finally. Good. Finally. Good. Because they said it never made any money. <laughs> the usual. Okay, so then you moved over to MCA and got into A&R. Yeah, so my lawyer plugged me in at the time. Uh, MCA didn't have an East Coast, well, no, they had an East Coast presence, but they didn't have an A&R person, so they hired me um, to work, uh, to be their um, East Coast head of A&R. Mm -hmm. So, of course, what's the first thing I do? Um, Joan Jett's label, Boardwalk Records, is going bankrupt, so I bring her over there. And a couple of other bands that really never made any noise or significance, but... Um, MCA was then known as the Music Cemetery of America. Mm -hmm. It was a very f***ed up company. Um, they had records. Every year they would drop the price of an album's list albums. We we'll start at, you know, 1098, 998, every year. Anyway, it was a very, very, very screwed up company. And the things I brought them that they didn't think had any merit, it was, it was a joke. I mean, I brought them Stevie Ray Vaughan's first album, and they said, Ah, blues guitarists, they don't sell, Steve. They're a dime a dozen. Okay. <laughs> then I said, uh, um, David Letterman show is a very popular musician component, the, the Paul Schaefer band. Yeah, maybe David Letterman means something in New York, but it doesn't mean anything out here on the West Coast. That's not, we're not going to do that. And so there was a bunch of those constant things. I brought them Cindy Lauper. She had just left her first band, Blue Angel, and they, uh, and like, she wanted a, a commitment to do a $30,000 video, and they didn't want to spend the money. Anyway, I got very, very frustrated, but it didn't matter that I was frustrated because there was a whole regime change, as there always are in the music industry, and they brought Irving Azoff in, and uh, Irving's the p most powerful person in the music industry today, and he was pretty powerful back then, and they're making him president of the company, blowing everybody out, including the entire East Coast office. And I get the phone call. Um, Hey, Steve, you're the senior person there. You might want to tell everybody that Friday's their last day. <laughs> so that's it. But more interesting to me is you were in radio and you were doing promotion. And what did they think made you qualified to be head of A&R or East Coast A&R? I'm trying to see what, what, what does uh, they, it take they, they liked me? They liked the fact, the fact that I was a guy who got records played on the radio. Mm -hmm. My first day on the job there... There's a phone on the desk with an unlisted number. I pick it up, and it's a t the, guy, the guy who's running the company at the time, a guy named Gene Froelich. Steve, WNBC is not playing the new Olivia Newton-John record. Um, can you go over there and find out what's going on? Yes, sir, of course. I'm like, I thought they wanted me to do A&R. Now they got me doing promotion. <laughs> okay, so two days later, that same little button lights up on the phone. It's him. Now... You know, it's 7 a.m. earlier in Los Angeles. Hey, Steve, um, such and such record is not getting played at this station in Long Island. I wonder if you could investigate that. So this happened a couple of times, and I'm like, this is weird. So finally, he calls me up one morning with another one of these, like, can you check this out thing? I go, uh, uh, Gene, I, I understand I'm happy to help, but I, I thought you guys wanted me to spend my time meeting with people and going out and finding some new talent for the label. Steve, let me ask you a question. What does it say on your paycheck? I haven't gotten paid yet. I, say. I, I guess it's going to say MCA Records. Exactly. <laughs> and you have to do whatever you can to increase the bottom line of that company. Now, you have expertise in radio. I expect you to help and solicit the radio stations and get the airplay as best as you can, in addition to your other responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so Irving did you a favor, actually. Uh, he's done lots of favors for me, <laughs> you could say. Irving but, doesn't um, do anybody a favor. So then you got hooked up I will, I will tell you, Irving left a, a typed letter on my desk offering my job to a competitor at Arista Records. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes in, and I said, uh, Mr. Azoff, do you and I have a problem? He goes, no, why? Well, there's this letter on my desk, you're offering this job to... He goes, oh, pfft, don't worry about that. <laughs> That's Irving. So Blackheart Records, then she forms a new. So she has her own label. So I'm out of work. So it's John come on, Jett. come on over here and help us get records played. So it's an interim place for me to hang my shingle and keep my contacts and things going because it's a business of amnesia. 
<coughs> if you're out of the business, you're out of the business. Mm -hmm. You've got to find a reason to stay in, and, and that was a legitimate way to keep myself going. Mm -hmm. So you were managing the office, or...? Well, I was doing a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Whatever it was, oh, going, it's a on small going on the road. Going on the road, you know, when she goes on the road, make sure she gets interviews, and uh, just keeping everything going. Right. Okay, so this is about 1984 now, and you've had one, two, three, four, five jobs Yeah, so, already. so you guys should know if you're looking for stability, um, you might want to find another career, because that's not what this industry is about. But there's no stigma in having five jobs in 10 years. Well, there's somebody, Mike, somebody at another record label said to me, if you're in the same job for more than two years, you're a failure. You've got to keep moving. I don't, know. I don't know that that's true, but... Um, yeah, I heard it. Um, Phil Quattarero once said that um, well, maybe it was Phil. if you're in a job two years and you don't get promoted, it's time to leave, which is probably right for this industry. So you move actually to now meeting Marty Bandier? Was he with the no, at the no, time? Um, um, his... Let's see. Ex father. Yeah. Was married to, um, right. F the Lefrax, who built Lefrax City and Newport Village real estate, but they also were very much involved or wanted to be involved in music. There was um, Francine Lefrac, who's a Broadway show producer and still is today. And then there was a daughter named Denise Lefrac. And if you guys care to go back in your doo wop history, there's a song called Denise by Randy and the Rainbows, and it was written about Denise Lefrac. And Denise somehow thought I was a nice guy and figured I should be an asset to the company that her, grandfather, her father had, um, his father, uh, called Lefrac Music. So um, they hired me to be an A&R scout for them at Lefrac Music. And um, what, what happened was uh, Denise was married to Marty Bandier. They got divorced. So they had to leave behind the assets of the company they built, and they really didn't know what to do with them. They had all this publishing and masters. They had Barbara Streisand, and they, they had some early Springsteen catalog, and uh, so they needed somebody there. So they figured that that might be a good fit. So I found out, though, really what they wanted me to be is babysitter. There was the youngest daughter, Jackie, who um, was probably 19 or something, Needed, she felt she needed to be in the music business, so it was my job to sort of be her babysitter. And the son, Richard, who was the um, builder, they were, at the time they were building Newport Village, came to my office and said, you know, I don't really believe in what you're doing. By the way, keep the volume down, because I'm having meetings. <laughs> but um, the, the day we sign something or have any success, I, I won't believe it. So it was very en encouraging. Yeah. So they, you weren't with them then when they morphed into the entertainment company? No, this was post-entertainment company. Oh, post-entertainment. This is the assets of the entertainment company because Koppelman ah. and Bandier had left because <clears throat> of the divorce. Right. All right. Because I met Marty, I think, at that time. And I was trying to figure out what they did. I said, well, you have Barbara Streisand. Are you producer? And he goes, no. I said, They're are you? a production company. Well, but they didn't produce her. So you manage her? No. And I walked out of there confused because I didn't know what an entertainment company did at that time. They didn't, weren't a record company. So they weren't a booking agent. They, so they, they, had, they had some deals with record labels so they could do things. They had a, a young artist from Long Island, a Springsteen, a wannabe called Billy Falcon. Mm -hmm. But what was great is they would find songs for Barbara Streisand. I'll never forget this. And they would promise, promise Barbara 50% of the copyright. Mm -hmm. But they only had 50% of it. <laughs> so basically they created 150% of something that they didn't control and they did that a couple of times um, it was very entertaining All right. okay then uh, Newark you actually went so after I left after um, I was unceremoniously told that uh, my services were no longer needed at Left Rack I was hanging about and uh, CBS Sony Got a phone call from a TV station in Newark, New Jersey. It was a TV station for people who wanted to watch movies but didn't have cable. 
called Wometco Home Theater. It was channel 68, broadcast UHF on top of the Empire State Building, and channel 67 in Smithtown, Long Island. Now, what you have to know, again, back in the Stone Age, there was no cable in Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, Staten Island, or parts of New Jersey. So <coughs> they wanted to increase the value of this. The owners were Metco. But they didn't want to do movies anymore. So they heard about this newfangled thing called MTV. They wanted to play music videos. And got a license to play the videos from the record companies. And Sony, CBS said, uh, no. No, unless, unless you know somebody, somebody we can trust that we feel comfortable with. And somehow my name gets thrown in the mix with business affairs. I don't know how. And um, they want me to go out to Newark and have the meeting with this guy, um, uh, Mr. Flynn. And Mr. Flynn uh, was a man in his, probably in his 60s, nothing about any kind of music. He was mostly a sales guy. And I said, oh, OK. He said, look, I, I can pay you a salary. And if something happens, I'll give you a month's severance. Can you start next week? I went, yeah, I, I can start next week. Okay. Can you show me your video library? Yeah. It takes me downstairs. This is in central city of Newark. And it's this big cinder block room with steel gray shelves, empty. I go, okay, so this is, where, where's the library? Well, you're in it. Well, where's the material you want to broadcast? Oh, 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 you're going to get that. And you want to be on the air when? So my friends at CBS gave me a handful of videos on pneumatics, and we created a three-hour block of music videos and, and played it over and over. And this went on for a couple of weeks until every week I got Warner Brothers send stuff. And, other, and we built up this following. We didn't have a budget, so we didn't have any on-air hosts. I had a, a booth announcer who I had to teach how to pronounce it was David Bowie. That's what you say, David Bowie. But he didn't know. He came from an R&B station. He was, he, was a, um, he was a guy from the South. Anyway, so I had a booth announcer and a very uh, uh, inspiring crew who really wanted to do this. And so we created these little, I figured this out, create these little 15-minute modules. And I would put it on an index card, what was on it. And then I would schedule module A, module B, and, C, and flip it around. And, you know, and what I did was to keep the record companies happy is I showed the album cover before the video. So you see the cover of the album or the CD and then, and then eventually artists started catching on to it. And I think the first artist that might have come was John Bon Jovi. He was just putting out his first record and he drove up the turnpike with his uh, son. Um, and um, and that, that sort of started it. And it, that went on. We, we had um, some I put wrestling on. I had the first rap show on. I had a thing called Fresh Rap. Every night I had an hour of headbanging music. Um, and uh, I had a Christian music video show on Sunday mornings. And Saturday afternoons I had a country show. And um, I got married. And I'm walking around with my index cards on my honeymoon, calling up and saying, OK, here's tomorrow's schedule. <laughs> and I get a phone call saying, hey, we just played uh, the band from Texas, Jason and the Scorchers. The song's called Shop It Around. I go, oh, that's a good song. Yeah, it's the last video we're playing. We just sold to the Home Shopping Network. Um, enjoy your honeymoon. <laughs> so I come back from my honeymoon. Um, and at baggage claim, I see Irving Azoff. <laughs> that was weird. Um, anyway, came back unemployed. And um, So were there other independent video stations at the time? The only other station that was like us 18 hours or more a day was up in Boston called uh, V66. Mm -hmm. And they had a big budget, and they had on-air hosts. It was a much more, uh, they, had, they had budgets, and they had stuff. I mean, we, we had commercials and advertising eventually, but there were lots of local video shows. So a lot of non-network affiliates would show an hour of music videos, you know, on a late night, a Friday, mm -hmm. Saturday, before there was Friday night videos. And so I would pick a lot of those shows and put them on our station, just, just in some additional programming. So, right. Um, right. yeah, so... Um, but what I didn't know at the time was a former disc jockey friend of mine from WNBC was living in the dorms at Columbia University, which didn't have cable. And so he was watching what I was doing. And he also became the general manager, eventually president of MTV. So when he heard I was laid off and he had been at my, at my wedding, he said, come on in. He hired me as a consultant 
to work with the on-air hosts, the VJs, if you will, to improve their uh, on-camera performance, if you will. So I was hired as a consultant. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got my entree into MTV. So you started... That was when MTV actually showed music videos, believe it or not. It was, it was a very important, influential way. I know you guys will probably find that difficult to believe, but back then, the easiest way for a song to break was have a great music video and get it played at MTV. And then they had a thing called, you jack the phones. We would hire companies where they'd have people sit in a boiler room and just endlessly call and request the video, and it would show up on a very, very influential show on MTV, which was shown every afternoon, like at 4 o'clock, called Total Request Live. Mm -hmm. and it was, this, was, this was the point where everybody would go and watch, and you found out what was going on, and that's how you broke music, mm -hmm. believe it or not. And they started day partying, sort of. Well, they, they, tried, mean, they tried every Ed trick in the book. Wrong. Oh, my God. They, MTV tried every trick in the book to get ratings. Mm -hmm. But it was a concept. It really wasn't a ratings getter. But they sold a lot of advertising, made a lot of money, until the novelty of music videos wore off. And then with, when the internet became accessible to everybody, it was like, what do we need to sit and wait for the new Madonna video? I can watch it right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you worked your way up to uh, international, too? Did you yeah, so when they give you the internet, back then when they gave you international, it, meant it was like you're one step from the grave. Now mm -hmm. it's not. But anyway, right. so they put me in charge of MTV. Uh, international, and uh, we had a cast, well, first it was MTV Internacional, so I got to start a Latin version of MTV on Telemundo, and I found a weather girl in Newark, uh, and I said, oh, she'd be great, and that was Daisy Fuentes, so she became the first person on MTV uh, Internacional based here in the States, then they said, help us with MTV Japan, that was fun, help us, we launched MTV Brazil, and then they said, you're going to be pan-European, so help, help the folks in England get the MTV. It was in England. Try to get it in other countries. Um, but they forgot to tell the people in Europe that there was a guy in New York, and the f folks in Europe didn't like that. So they made enough noise, so my position was eliminated, and I was out of work. <laughs> and this was around 1990, 91 or so? Probably. And somebody heard about you now at... PLG, Polygram. So a guy I'd known, music business guy, a fellow named Rick Dobbis. Yeah. He, actually it was John Scher, the concert promoter, introduced, reintroduced me and said, you should go over there. They need somebody to be head of alternative radio promotion and video promotion. So they hired me at Polygram, which no longer is a company. It was absorbed. But back then it was a, one of the one of the big guys, and so I was hired to be their head of um, alternative radio and video, and they gave me uh, some initials in front of it that made it very impressive. And you <laughs> took some alternative bands and... Yeah, got, we, some. yeah, we had, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a time when people actually listened to the radio and, mm -hmm. and, and alternative radio was actually playing new music and um, exposing new artists that people had never heard of. So, um, what did we have? We had back then, we had the Meat Puppets. Mm -hmm. which Cranberries. They, they became even bigger on the heels of uh, Nirvana um, playing some of their songs. And then the Cranberries, which were this little band from Limerick Island. And um, they had a song called Linger, which just became a huge, big hit. Right, so we now move in about another 10 years Not that long. from what I just said. <laughs> I was at 83, now we're at about 94, and you have another one, two, three, four jobs. I hope they're still interested in all this. Excuse me now? I hope they're interested. Well, I just want to sort of prove that you can do a lot of things in this business. And, uh, of course, now he's vice president of talent at Sirius, but it didn't, they didn't just pull him from uh, some sort of a employment agency. I mean, I'm trying to make the point of the amount of background he brought my to Sirius. Career. My checkered career. Right, but we're not done yet. We're at only going to Island Records after this. Okay. All right. And what's interesting is, too, that in this resume, anyway, there's not too much, like, you weren't out of work. I mean, no. like, it was like 91 to 93, then 93 to 94. Then 96, then I, I mean, you like, you were wanted. Well, Polygram morphed into Island. 
Yes. So it was more of the same, essentially. <clears throat> right, but we have U2 now, and we have... We uh, had the Achtung Baby going on the road with U2. Bob Marley. A grant, win, they win the Grammy. Um, I don't know where I... I guess I'm in it. I don't know where I was, but the phone rings that during the Grammys, and my wife answered the phone. Hi, it's Bono. Is Steve there? And she goes, yeah, right. Hangs up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, few and your later. wife was a radio personality. Yeah, she, yeah, she was in the business. Programmer, yeah. yeah. So the phone rings again. It's manager Paul McGinnis. He goes, uh, Wendy? Yes. It's Paul McGinnis. And she goes, oh. Uh, well, Bono just want to thank Steve for being part of helping them get the Grammys. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's, it's one of those moments. Right. So you did that only for a year. And then you moved over to, <coughs> excuse me, Universal and Doug Morris. So Doug Morris was a guy that had a small independent label that Atlantic distributed called Big Tree Records. And he was the chairman of Warner, Communica uh, Warner Music Group. And when he got fired, as everybody does, um, he, Edgar Brofman, who owns Seagram's Beverages, said, I want to start a music label. Um, we're going to call it Rising Tide. Okay. And they hired a guy named Daniel Glass, who now runs a company called Glass Note, which maybe you might be familiar with. And Daniel tries hiring me to be his head of promotion. And of course, music industry being where everyone is so polite and follows the rules, um, got his head handed to him for dare offering me a job without discussing it with my immediate superior. Um, but then when my contract lapsed, I, I said, you know, we can talk now. And he offered me this job, and I politely turned him down. And then he did his sales number on me. And he closed me and got me to, to leave what was then Island Polygram to go to this tiny little label called Rising Tide. Rising Tide didn't have an office. We worked out of the recording studio of the Hit Factory. <laughs> they gave us a conference room. And then we sat around a desk. And we would fight over the one phone. But being the entrepreneur I was, I looked on the bottom one day and I saw a jack. So I brought, home a, a, brought from home a phone and plugged it in and I went, I have my own phone. I can dial out. You guys can fight over that phone. Um, so it was like it was literally like that. Um, they had if they had a meeting with an artist they want to sign, everybody had to leave. Um, <laughs> so they signed a band from Arkansas called Ho Hum. Actually, one of them was like a, a security guy for uh, the Clintons when they were um, the governor. Anyway, they recorded the record down in Muscle Shoals, which was a real trip. Getting to go to Muscle Shoals go to the Fame Studios. This, this is where Percy Sledge played the organ. This is where Otis Redding sang. That's the piano Aretha Franklin recorded on. Anyway, so um, we're down there, and the phone rings, and Daniel gets a phone call that the chairman of MCA has been fired, and Doug Morris has now been promoted to oversee the entire MCA uh, situation. So this little tiny label I went to join, a boutique label, all of a sudden, as he said to me, well, I may have told you one thing, but things change. And I, and I, I laughed because I knew he's a very ambitious man, and I knew he wasn't going to be happy putting out a bunch of small labels through a boutique label, Rising mm -hmm. Tide. So uh, that morphed into Universal. And I stayed there for, I guess, seven years, I think it was, until I got itchy again. And, that was your um, first senior vice president. Yeah. yeah you worked yeah, up. Yeah, yeah another, another initial. Um, and they had you, at, it says here, new technologies too, in 2002? Yeah, so, you know, instead of putting you in international, they put you in new technologies. Ah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, so um, I was like, okay. So, um, I'm informed that Virgin Records is moving to the East Coast, and they need somebody to be their rock video guy. And I was like, nah, I don't want, I, I've been with these people since they were like a tiny label. I was the second person they hired. I, I don't want to leave and do that. But, you know, they put me in this weird thing, new technologies. I had a fire, the woman. It was just, it, was not, it wasn't a pleasant experience for me, but I didn't, I don't know. But I made one mistake. I'll give this to you as a word of advice. It's not the company you work for. It's the people you work with. And I forgot that. And I went to work with these knuckleheads at Virgin. Um, I took a slight salary cut. 
because I said, okay, I can build this again. Here I am starting up again, doing it up. I built up a t you know, radio station, a TV station, a record company. And I'm, okay, I'm the startup guy. Okay, I can take this on. But I didn't realize what you know, not nice people I was working with. And uh, that relationship went sour within about nine months. Um, and they kind of just bought me out of my situation um, there. They didn't, you know, I, I, would, I would tell them the truth. They didn't like that. Mm -hmm. I left Perfect Circle was number one at rock radio and Courtney Love had her second most added record from her album that didn't really sell and um, which she was well Cor not able to be handled at that time well Courtney was uh, pretty messed up back then um, and um, almost got me pretty messed up too because what I realized was I was becoming indirectly an enabler by allowing her to say things and do things um, and so much so that in between when I left there I took a couple of substance abuse counseling classes just because I was getting so freaked out by things I mean I kept I mean I kept the alcohol anonymous book in my office for mm -hmm. people because unfortunately entertainment industry tracks people who have addiction problems and so I still have that book and it's all crumpled up certain pages because she was like <laughs> <laughs> anyway so um, <clears throat> It was, it, was very, it was very sad because um, she was really needed help and no one cared enough. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and who was running Virgin at the time? So they had this brilliant idea. We're going to bring in a record producer and an administrator lawyer guy. So they had this guy, Matt Serletic, who was known for um, producing hit records. He did Smooth by Santana. And Roy Lott, who had been Clive's number two guy at Arista, but more on the administrative side. Mm -hmm. And this was gonna, supposedly going to work, but you know, Matt had no managerial skills whatsoever. And Roy was just a, a mean, mean person. Mm. So it was, not a, it was not a good combination. And shortly after they threw me out of there, it imploded and mm -hmm. it doesn't even exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you hear about this non-terrestrial radio station or this idea for non-terrestrial? Well, one of the radio guys I became acquainted with programmed a radio station in L.A. against KROQ, K-Rock. He also programmed a modern rock station um, here um, up in Westchester. And he and I would every so often get together for lunch because he lived in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So he, sa he was now head of music programming at, at Sirius Satellite Radio and was saying, you know, i, I got to find somebody who knows how to ins and out of the record companies because they really don't get us yet. Of course, why should they? I mean, the satellite's just gone up, and they had maybe 4,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. So I called him up and said, well, you're still looking for somebody? He said, yeah. I said, well, I have somebody for you. He said, who? I said, me. So they hired me as a consultant to work with um, the labels, and co coincidental or concurrent with that, um, I think three months later, they also announced that they had hired Howard even mm -hmm. though he couldn't start. Mm -hmm. So they went from a small amount of, when I was there, under 10,000 subscribers to today, we're over 30 million. Right. Um, and I've been there. They, they hired me as a consultant, and within a year they had decided they didn't want to have any more consultants. They said, let's, let's have people on staff or not. Mm -hmm. And so um, they put me on staff as VP of Talent Industry Affairs. Right, and you were there then... <laughs> There was still XM and Sirius. There was XM in Washington and Sirius in New York. There were two different satellite services. Right. We and to a very much a competitive environment. And how old was the station when you hired? They, were, they had started two or three years before my arrival, but the satellites hadn't gone up for more than a year uh, when I got there. Um, mm -hmm. they, built this, they built these fantastic studios, state of the art, it was developed by this uh, Canadian guy who had this vision of satellites in the sky beaming music down to cars. Mm -hmm. um, right. So you are in charge of anything that has to do with the music industry in terms of they personnel? They wanted, wanted me to... The programmers were busy programming. They, they, weren't getting any, they weren't getting the phone calls from the record label saying, hey, can you play this? Hey, I want to send over the new such and such record. Mm -hmm. um, and so they just, 
you know, and, and get and cajoling artists to come over, which we still have to do today. It's like, come on over. Oh, 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 I want to. I want. Come on. I want you to go on the radio and talk about your new music. Mm -hmm. um, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so it was getting that and. Um, right. So you have a staff under you of. Oh, we had a staff of uh, about four people then. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Just in charge of, well, different genres. This person, this person specialized in hip hop and rap. This person was the rock guy. This person was the pop guy. This person did Latin and jazz. I mean, this was the country person. So everybody had their little niche. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of still that way, but there's more bodies. And whose idea was it to start these artist channels? There's so many of them now. You know. I can't, I can't say for sure. I mean, I, I know that I was the one who pushed them for the Springsteen channel and said, mm -hmm. we should do a channel and call it E Street Radio. So um, they had initially, I think, had the Elvis channel. So I don't know. I think, you know, it's now we have channels that pop up. Like this month, we have the Billy Joel channel for 30 days. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when David Bowie passed away, we had a Bowie channel for two weeks. Um, I suspect in the future we'll have an Eagles channel at some mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. um, so, and of course you've got to work very closely with the management and the, and the record companies because you can't just, a terrestrial station go, okay, we're going to do a weekend of nothing but David Bowie. You bring records in, the CDs in, you play them. We can't do that. As a, a digital broadcaster or satcaster, we're subject to the rules of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act from 1972, and it requires us to get a waiver. So we have to kiss major booty to get the permission and rights to play more than three songs in a 90-minute period by the same artist. We can't play more than two back-to-back, -back, et cetera, et cetera. It was done to protect um, the artist from the dreaded fear of uh, somebody recording their music off the satellite, which I guess people can do, but I don't know what it's You're all right. <laughs> Guillotine. <laughs> anyway, anybody have any questions about that sordid uh, career story? All right. Hope I didn't put anybody to sleep. Oh. That's, that's, my, uh, that's my LinkedIn photo. That's his LinkedIn photo. So don't follow that for, a, for your LinkedIn. Uh, I'm just going to try up a few of these. This one you've always... Uh... So when I had my own company, there was a magazine called Punk Magazine. And uh, the artist is uh, pretty well known in that circle, John Holmstrom. And for some strange reason, he allowed me to pay him some paltry sum and created that visual, which I still use today. People think it's funny, so. Yeah, you use it on your... Um, Emails. And your blog and so on. Yeah, anytime somebody asks me for a photo, I send them that. And this was roughly 90? Oh, I don't know, that was some, some crazy interview. Um, I guess, yeah. And you were where at that time? I, uh, I don't know, Possi possibly uh, my own company. Would you buy a used car from this guy? <laughs> <laughs> I would. Right. Oh, excuse me. I got to get back to what I was doing. Well, somebody did some I digging. I can't. I'm lost. <laughs> I'm finished. Class is done. Me too. Oh, dear God. This is recently? <laughs> no. Okay, that's... I think that was done at Live Earth. The woman in the middle is, of course, Kelly Carson. Yeah. And, and that, Randy. And Randy. And... Uh, and you. And uh, several co-workers. Yes. So it's got to be within the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, if you look up Live Earth... 
That was, I think it was the Meadowlands, maybe? I could, oh, God. <laughs> Very recently? Uh, two or three years ago. Anybody who knows who that is on the other side? Cousin Brucey, Cousin Brucey yeah. And um, actually, that was his first Palisades amusement park return thing, I th I or think, what? I think it might have been, yeah. Yeah. So how long ago was that? So it's three years ago. It's at the Meadowlands in uh, June. Um, I'm happy to tell you there'll be another one this June, too. And I see you both have a hat on in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> He'd agree. What else he got there? What is that? Oh, um, MTV? Uh, Barnes & Noble uh, in-store promoting that book on MTV when we had the, we had the two fellows here. Right. The book on MTV. And who are the other people? Uh, the authors. Uh-huh. Let's see. Um, I can't tell. And the guy to the left of you? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, that was good. It's had a checkered <laughs> career, that's for sure. Um, it is a checkered career. What oh, year yeah. was this? 2003? Is that right? No, that's not right. 72? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 74. So oh. the guy in the middle is the guy who gave me my first job at Atlantic. And the guy in the far left is John David Kolodner, who's known for producing, uh, well, he found Foreigner, put that together. He produced a couple of share records, Aerosmith, uh, worked with ACDC. I think. That's all you could find? I think that's it. Oh. I think Give, that's it. Okay, you, Dave, I, do you have any questions to start off the... Uh, yeah. Hey. I have, I have hey. some questions. Questions, eh? Questions, you know. Hey. This, uh, some of these have to do with uh, things you were talking about okay. and then some other stuff. Go ahead. Um, one thing, when you were, you mentioned this when you were at the Blackheart days and you took a job working with Blackheart Records just to stay in the business because you mentioned basically if you're out of the business, you're out of the business. Can you kind of touch a little bit more upon that, maybe some people you knew who once they um, were out of the business and they couldn't get back in, and what are some tricks to stay in the business if by chance you're eliminated or transitioned out? Um, somebody gave me the analogy of you all, as little kids, played the game musical chairs. The music stops, somebody pulls a chair out. You guys know that game? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's what the industry is like today. So if you lose your job, the chair gets pulled out, and unless you are entrepreneurial, um, there's no place for you to go. Do you want me to help you? I'm good with it. I heard that. You're free right now. <laughs> it comes with a kiss. It's okay, but I have a master's degree in TV, radio, and film, so I know how to insert. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so um, I think it's really important. Look, I, I tell my students, uh, as I also work at a community college. I tell them, listen, here's your job. You want to take a resume, be dumb like me and go to the HR department. Of course, that was back in the Stone Age, but you take a resume, go to the HR department. You want an entry level position, maybe it'll work for you, maybe not. But in most cases, your job, each and every one of you, is to invent something, manage something, discover something, or build something that someone's going to want to pay you a lot of money for or they're going to try to steal from you. That's really your job. Because if you think you're going to leave these hallowed halls of ivy and go somewhere and, and with your resume and internships and think, OK, but you, you, you can't. So again, if you lose your job, then you start doing something. You manage something. You, you build something. Uh, you volunteer, although that's difficult these days at companies. But you got to stay in the business. What I did. One of my things was, when I was out of work, I wrote a guest editorial for Billboard magazine. Now, I don't know if they still would accept that, although, you know, free uh, writing would seem to be something that they'd gladly accept these days. But I wrote, you know, an editorial on something at the time that was going on. 
just, just to keep it out there. Because, like I said, it's very easy to forget. Mm -hmm. As I was once told, it was a trade publication called the Friday Morning Quarterback. I remember going visiting the publisher. And he said to me, look to your left, look to your right, and you'd be surprised who's passing through and who's staying. And I think about that a lot these days because a lot of the people I started with or people I worked with, where are they? I got, I got a lot of friends. I just got a phone call to a guy who was a big deal. He was a program director and a music director upstate New York. He was a trade publication liaison. Now he's, he's selling life insurance. Mm -hmm. so it's, hey, listen, I, I got that. I don't need that. Or I have former business friends who are real estate agents. And if you think that's easy, you can ask this young lady here. She'll tell you it's not easy. Mm -hmm. But um, so you got to do what you got to do. So if you're fortunate and blessed enough to get a seat at the table, you got to do everything you can to stay there. Mm -hmm. And part of that, would you agree, the, the, the cliche perception is reality is part of it too. For example, uh, you mentioned writing an editorial for a billboard, you know, um, and a lot about the little blurb after you write something, you see something in italics about the author. And, it, you know, Steve Leeds is an adjunct professor at, you know, William Patterson University and runs steveleeds.net or something like that. Just the fact right. that, that you have that, that website, for example. Like if, if Sirius XM laid you off tomorrow, you could still have a couple things to, to put at that blurb and it's still, oh, he's still in it. He's still doing something. And you might not be doing much of anything, but it still appears like it's that way you can still kind of have a foot in the door. Yeah, appearances, mm -hmm. appearances matter. Yeah, okay, and you look great. <laughs> now, you, you look marvelous. Oh, thank you. Now, here, here's something, because you did bring this up, because you were eliminated, you've been fired, you've been laid off, you've been transitioned out, all the nice ways to say you've lost your job a number of times. We, you know, the, we're, re, we're reconnoitering things here and your position has been eliminated. Mm -hmm. And it's happened enough to you, yes. So, and it's, gonna, it's happened to me. I, have you ever been fired, mm -hmm. Marconi? Mm -hmm. From what? Well, I don't have to tell you, but yes, I have. <laughs> but um, it may happen to these guys here. How do you deal with that? How, um, especially the, you know, the more it's, it's happened, I don't know if you, you build up a, a tolerance well, to it. Or listen, it's, ne it's never fun. And so, again, I say, if you want a safe, secure job, as I was warned many years ago, go do something else. But I remember distinctly the situation at Virgin Records. So, as I mentioned, we had number one this, number one that. And Courtney Love was in my office all week long smoking. And I'd buy her an ashtray. You're not allowed to smoke in the building. So I walk in on a Tuesday morning and uh, the HR lady would like to see you. And I go, they're going to tell me she was smoking in the office. I walk upstairs and you go to the HR office and I look in and there's the, bo the, the woman I worked for. And I go, oh, this isn't about Courtney Love's ashtrays. And Steve, uh, we're... Uh, you know, we're making some changes in the structure, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I, I didn't let her go through it. I didn't want to hear the bull. And I just said, fine, I get it. Don't waste your time. Just let me know what my benefits are and that you're honoring my salary commitment. Well, yeah, but we want to, no, don't tell me anything. <laughs> what I didn't know is downstairs the IT guys had taken my computer away and all my contacts are in there. And I go, oh, oh, oh hold on. Now, luckily, I had them backed up on another, in another situation, but um, they, I persuaded them to give me a disk that supposedly had the contacts, and to this day, I still can't figure out how that disk is supposed to work because <laughs> it didn't work. But, I mean, it, listen, you don't, you don't want to hear it, um, and so I didn't want to hear it, so I just cut it out. I said, I don't need to hear the bullshit because at the end of the day, all you care about is what are you doing about my salary and what are you doing about my benefits? At the end of the day, nothing else really matters because they can sit there and go, well, we really didn't want to, you know, they try to, they try to massage it and make you feel, it's like, it's all bull****. You know, just, you know, you just, it ain't fun. Okay. So it just, it never gets any easier, obviously. No, as we said, yeah. uh, when he leaves, 
he's going to get a multi-million dollar severance package. When I leave, I'm going to get an escort from the security guard and a box to carry my personal possessions out. Mm -hmm. We have that joke, a friend of mine at, at the company, because we, it's, it's not a question of if, it's just when. At some point, they tell you you're no longer invited to the party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why I tell you, be an entrepreneur. You can't fire yourself. You did bring up, when you were doing the Courtney Love discussion about, you, you went to some substance abuse sessions. What, what was the point? That was because you wanted to learn how to deal with these people who were having these problems? What, what was that? I, I, ha I had a friend um, who was a radio announcer who I spent about two years getting him a job at MTV. And after about six months there, I got a phone call and say, why didn't you tell us he had a, a substance abuse problem? I go, what? I'm naive. I, I, I didn't know that. And then the Courtney thing, and so I was saying the wrong things, you know, helping him. He's, he's, in, uh, he's in supposedly in rehab, and he's calling me up. He said, hey, um, can you get me a copy of Billboard magazine? And, and a pad and some paper. I don't have that here. Well, I didn't know, but that's not, they're supposed to focus on their problem, not be reading Billboard. And then Courtney's thing was like, she came in one day, she always came in late. She's supposed to be in at 10 o'clock to call radio. She'd come in at 2 o'clock. I, I knew that was going to happen. And she came in one day crying that um, had I seen one of the tabloids, they said she wasn't suitable to be a parent. Mm -hmm. And she was crying. And, you know, I'm, I'm a, I don't know what to do when I see a woman crying, nonetheless Courtney Love. And um, I go to the woman I work for, and I said, um, hey, listen, looks like Courtney Love is going to have the number one most added record next week. Yes, we see. Well, she's in my office right now crying, and I don't know what to do, because I've already gone through the, the roster of executives that have relationships with her, and none of them were available or around. I said, yeah, well, if it's too much for you, just go down the hall. There's some empty offices there. You can finish up your business there. And I, and I was like, no, that's not right. But I don't know what to do. I have no idea what to do to stop her from crying. And, you know, I can say all these things, but I don't know if they're the right things to, to say to somebody in that situation. So on, when I got home, I was like, I got to do something. And they, at the time... Um, New Jersey was offering some substance abuse courses in, in Hackensack. So I took um, two classes and I said, okay, I, I, I think I understand now and have a better understanding of what, you know, that don't be an enabler. Hmm. That's, such, uh, that's some of the uh, extracurricular education you wouldn't expect to, no. to take. That's, that's interesting. Um, at Sirius XM, one of the things you do in... Um, Marconi touched upon it. You know, you manage a team of celebrity bookers. Yes. When I read it, it feels like I'm celebra celebrity hookers, but it's celebrity bookers. <laughs> so explain a little bit more about what these, how many people there are now, um, what they specifically do, and what made them qualified to do what they do. Well, when I got there, I inherited a department, and there was a See, there were two women, and there was a guy. The guy worked at VH1 previously, and neither of the women had much experience, um, but they had a go-get attitude. Um, so over the years, I've hired different people. I hired, um, I hired this woman. She was uh, a producer slash booker for Good Morning America, and she didn't want to travel anymore. She wanted to wake up in her own bed every day. And so... Um, she came from Argentina, self-taught, um, graduated from Fordham, and she was a booker and had many contacts in Nashville. So I was able to woo her away. And then I um, uh, hired Spencer, who came from PIX Channel 11. He was the producer of their morning show. And when they brought in a new team, he was sort of left on the sidelines, and I had offered him the job several times before. He wasn't ready to leave. Now he was ready to leave. Um, I have a woman who I worked with at MTV, and she ran the Motown Cafe, and she was Aretha Franklin's publicist, and she was working at ABCO, the Stones label, and she knows everybody, and she was a guest here Tracy. last semester, Tracy Jordan. Um, 
we just hired uh, Eric Luftglass, who had had his own little management company. Before that, he had worked at MTV and VH1 for many years. Um, we hired a young woman who was a talent booker for Meredith Vera and knew the show was coming to an end. Um, so the skills these people have, it's they have contacts. They have a great network. They have, the, of, they have a Rolodex that's mm -hmm. active. Now, having said that, um, we've my... I don't want to call him my assistant. Uh, he started as my assistant. He was an intern for two semesters. And nearing the end of the second semester, the guy who had the job was a musician. He said, I, I want to try my... I want to try my hand at being a musician, and I want to have a career, so I'm leaving here. I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to try to be the next Billy Joel, if you will. And the guy who was my intern, I said, well, you want this job? You got it. And so he, I think he had two days between graduation and when he started. Um, we had a woman who interned last semester, um, and she just got a part-time job with us in the department, <coughs> and uh, she had no, no experience. And then uh, the woman who's been, there's, there's another part-timer, um, and she was an intern maybe five years ago, and I, there was just something about her, I don't know what it was, but I just sort of arm's length kept in touch, and she was working at the Brooklyn Bowl, and we needed a part-time position, and I asked her if she wanted to do this, and she jumped at the chance. She's still working part-time at the Brooklyn Bowl, but she works for us now, and we're all pushing, trying to get her um, full-time status, but she had no background other than she is a she plays bass in her little old girl rock band and um she she was a, a violin major and she taught she taught a music <coughs> she taught uh, private lessons in the violin but she didn't really have any experience but everyone loves her and she gets stuff done and people like will throw things at her and rely on her and she just knows how to get stuff done and what are the things being thrown at her that, that she needs to get I, done? I have two guests here now. I need somebody to take so-and-so from point A to point B. Um, I need somebody to pick up these laminates for the Bruce Springsteen show. I know I can trust you. Can you pick those up from the hotel? Can you... Um, she makes the nightly schedule of who's coming in the next day. Um, she goes through the paperwork of who was not responsible and didn't get a signed release. So that person is responsible going back and getting a release from the artist. So she's, you know, an integral part of the department. And you're overseeing all these people. Well, uh, yeah, there's, there's other people. There's, a, there's somebody above me who also oversees things, but um, for the most part, yeah. Okay. And, and your goal, do you have, like, I don't want to say a quota, but, but do you just go by go go by gut, or I know um, I know Taylor Swift is in town right. this week, so I gotta do whatever I can to make sure Taylor Swift Correct. comes over to the building. Correct. And you know we we know what guests are booked on the local TV shows and the national TV shows, and who's doing Saturday Night Live and who's doing Colbert and all that stuff. So we you know we keep track of who's coming into town, what you know what new releases, what new films, what Broadway shows are opening, um, like. Springsteen's in town, okay, because he's playing the garden. So Gary Talent, the bass player in the band, decided to put out his own record. So we get Gary to come up and talk about his record on East Street Radio, and there's maybe three or four other shows that'll want to talk to Gary Talent about his record. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's... So, so to get into that business, because I do know students who I've advised and who I've been around who love the idea of being around the celebrities and be, being, you know, they, they want to be yeah, like it's, a talent it's, booker. It's, it's sexy. We've had, I've had interns who, like, totally don't get it, and they think it's like, wow, I got to, mm -hmm. I got, today I got to meet so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And it's, it's not about that. I mean, if it's, that's what it's about for you, that's not what it's about, because it can get really tiresome and, you know, it's just... What, what, what are the tiresome parts? People are late, mm -hmm. you know. So, okay, so Steven Tyler records a country album. So he's in town to promote it. So you got to convince his people that he should, in addition to do the country channel, he should do the rock channels. But we don't want him to be labeled a rock artist because then the country guys won't play his record. So then we're trying to get him from, to go from this interview to that interview and interview. He likes to talk. He likes to stop. Anyone who wants to chat with him will stop. Then he found out um, uh, Macklemore was in the building. 
So he had to go see him and talk to him about it. So there's 20 minutes wasted, well, not wasted, but he's talking to him. And meanwhile, um, I, I don't have studio time, and he's going to wind up doing a 30-minute interview in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so it's like, great, talk to Malcolm more, but right now we need you over here. Um, or I need my coffee. I, I don't know where I put the coffee cup. Can you? I, I can't do this. I, I got to have my coffee. Mm -hmm. I get the phone call Sunday. Steve, um, does Sirius XM have a coffee grinder? <laughs> um, I, I think the uh, coffee machine has a built-in grinder. No, 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 no. He only will drink Kona coffee, and we have the Kona beans. Do we need to go out and buy a grinder, or do you guys have one? Quickly segue to what color M&Ms do you want in the dish? <laughs> you know, I mean, right. really? I mean, what year is it? Okay, okay, fine. You need a coffee grinder. I'll get you. No, 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 we'll, we'll get one. Don't worry about it. Mm. Or when, um, <clears throat> when, <laughs> I guess the first guy who came in and refused to drink out of these toxic bottles, I only drink from glass. I'll have a glass... Uh, please get bottled water in a glass. In fact, please make sure it's available in a glass. <sighs> He's got bigger problems today. My, you, you have relationships with the management team, though, as well. Well, you know, so that's the thing. You know, you have a relationship with the manager. You want to try to have a relationship with the artist or the record label. You try to have a relationship with, you know, whomever is more accessible and whether they really care. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk about keeping that network up. You know, we talked about you staying in the business, but, um, you know, everybody who, for years, you've been doing this music management summer, how long have you been booking the artists for, you know, the people who come into this? So I've been there now. I think it's uh, coming up, I can't believe this, 11 years. Yeah, here 11. at William Patterson? Doing that? I'm here at William Patterson. Well, I'm here... Yeah, yeah, probably over, about No, that. about 11 years. About no, 11, more okay. than that here. Yeah, maybe a couple of years. So, yeah, so, okay. yeah. Before, and then, and then before Sirius, Sirius. And Sirius, um, about 11 years also. Okay. Yeah, because last year we had uh, Julie Greenwald, and we had, uh, you know, you mentioned Tracy, uh, Tracy Jordan, 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 and uh, Donna Eichmeyer. Alyssa Pollock, and we've and had... Le Leanne, right. who, who, had, who yeah. said she had enough and got out. Yeah, Leanne Callahan, who is uh, Beyonce's manager, was here last year in March, I guess it was, and then... I've had enough. Goodbye. I'm out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is interesting. Imagine walking away from Beyonce, you know, managing Beyonce. You're all saying you'd never do it. But, oh, uh, oh, no. After a couple of months, you'd do it. Uh-huh. It's, it's <laughs> interesting. But that, that network, I mean, networking is so important, it, just... Getting to you know people. Keep your, yeah, keep your Rolodex yeah, keep and your contacts. And, you know, I fight with the IT department. I go, you guys better not f*** this up and lose my contacts. Mm -hmm. i got over 3,000 names in there. And if you guys screw that up, you're going to have a problem. Right. Do you send out Christmas cards? I mean, no. with 3,000, how do you keep in touch with, is it a lot of it just every three or four years or somebody? It's whenever you know, so-and-so, you know, Eric Clapton's got a new record coming out this spring. Let's see if we can uh, torture somebody in his camp and get him to do something. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, you know, uh, Coldplay's doing the Super Bowl halftime. We've got to talk to Coldplay and make sure that they know we're going to broadcast their halftime show with Beyonce and with Bruno Mars. So Bruno Mars did Super Bowl last year, so we, I have, you know, Brandon Creed is his manager. So, you know, last year we had the, can you sign their same release? It was the same one as last year. Remember? We did this last year? Oh, yeah, okay. All right. Interesting. Okay. All right. Can you talk about... Uh, By the way, Doug Morris's quote, I should bring it up. You want loyalty? Get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Sad, but very true. Okay. Sirius XM within the music ecosystem. You know, t what, what should they know about Sirius XM radio as it pertains to the music business. So today I was visited by my friend Jill Weindorf, and Jill is the executive vice president of promotion and marketing and all sorts of fancy titles, originally from Fairlawn, and now they're in L.A. And they're 
one of the biggest labels out there right now. Um, and she said, I bring every piece of music here first. Because not only do you guys deserve it, but I can get a read right away. I know exactly what's going on. So she's got a band now called, the band is called The Record Company. <laughs> okay? So she said, your channel, The Spectrum, is playing it a lot. And she said, our sales doubled this week. So she knows if that happens, that that record, chances are that's a hit. And now she can go running around to all these other little terrestrial radio stations and saying, I know this record's a hit. Um, so for, from the music industry, industry's point of view, we are a very important, influential tool. Our top 40 station has the largest reach of any top 40 station in the world, uh, arguably. And they can play any record and it's gonna, it's gonna show up in iTunes selling a couple of thousand pieces a week if it's a hit song. And the, the bottom line is, it's gotta be a hit. So you can like it, I can like it, the producer can like it, but if it doesn't hit a responsive chord in an individual, it doesn't matter. And that's the, that's the key to it all. And so, I guess unbeknownst, there's a byproduct of what we do we can be a proving ground or testing ground, if that's the right word, for to find out if a song, piece of music, is working and strikes interest in the consumer to want to spend money and buy it. Having, sa having said that, not every record company understands that or takes advantage of that. Um, some of them are a little s slow to gain that information or that insight. But with a, with this, you know, with a base of 30 million subscribers and people who are paying for the service, Chances are they're paying more attention to the radio than the casual listener in their car. They're doing this because they're passionate about the music, they're passionate about what they listen to, and they don't want to hear the commercials and whatnot. So they're motivated music consumers. How and many they, subscribers do we have in the room? <clears throat> How many are subscribers of Sirius? Look know, at that. It's, the it's, entire it's, it's, it's an expense. It, a lot of poor college kids don't have the resources to, to it's, you know, and they'll listen to a Spotify right. or uh, an iHeart. Um, What's your demographic uh, age-wise? It's, 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 it tilts male, and it's, it's more middle-aged, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the same thing as a car owner. Because, I mean, car owners are the way the f people first get, to, uh, get into it. And you can listen to um, Spotify for free. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's a subscription, but not a paid subscription, and it's a stream, but it's different because our music is curated by professional programmers, and we have announcers on many of the channels, and we offer programming that I would say is um, drastically different because we have all the NFL games, mm -hmm. you know, we have the NBA, we have every sport covered, mm -hmm. um, and we have many comedy channels. Uh, you know, uh, we offer in markets like New York where there's no alternative radio, we have one of the more successful alternative radio platforms in the country. Mm -hmm. So we offer things that, you know, we do exclusive concerts and events um, that can't really be replicated. And then there's the artist channels, mm -hmm. which, you know, iHeart will have a, a Madonna iHeart channel, but it's not just Madonna. When we do an artist channel, it's predominantly that artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel this is a stupid question, but are you international? I mean, I know you're in a satellite, but are you in every country in the so world? So the or? footprint of the satellite that we use, we have, well, we have six satellites up there. Some, are, um, some go around the equator and move with the Earth's rotation. The others are the same orbit as a Russian spy satellite because uh, they were um, launched from uh, various parts of the Soviet Union. And it's a figure eight. So just draw a figure eight over North and South America. So when the satellite goes to the equator, it shuts down and the solar panels recharge it. And then when it comes back up, then, you know, that way. So you can, the, the footprint of the satellite does cover the Caribbean. We are, if you say, are we international? Yes, we're international because we get Canada. But I mean, as far as um, we would like, there have been discussions in the past in Mexico um, but they haven't been able to figure out how to make it economically um, viable um, because you have to license, create licenses in each of the territories mm -hmm. with the music copyright holders. 
and as far as being something in Europe or something, our satellites don't even go near there. So mm -hmm. it's just over North and South America. So for, for Sirius XM to... But you can listen to it overseas on the internet, which more and more people are using our app to listen to it. And that comes with your subscription. Is that an well, add anybody, anybody in the room can download the app. It's just then you have to you subscribe. Have to pay for it though, yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. huh. And there are people I know overseas illegally listening. All they have to have is a U.S.-based credit card because that's all we know. The credit cards in the United States, we don't know where you live. Mm -hmm. Okay. Question. Yeah. Ah. Come to the mic. Mm. Make sure it's on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have like two questions. So, sure. uh, first of all, um, so for all the different stations, you have um, different, I guess, DJs for each different station. Is that how that works? Well, um, some announcers will do um, more than one channel. So, like, you'll have this many announcers, and they'll do this many channels. It's, it's, it's up to the um, programmers and the announcers, like um, former MTV VJ Mark Goodman. He's on the 80s channel, and he's also on the Spectrum. Okay. People so it's kind of delegated between... Well, I think it's, it, the pro, it's ultimately up to the programmer who, what the voice is and who they want to hire. Okay. Um, and then my second question was, um, so you have like, uh, like Z100 as a serious station. So how do you how does that benefit you guys? Because like the radio stations. It doesn't. Stations, yeah, I was gonna. So, when we merged with XM, apparently XM had some financial difficulties starting. So they made a deal with the um, then it was Clear Channel, now it's iHeart, mm -hmm. and they built into the deal that they always carry Z100, Kiss LA, um, station in Chicago. There's four stations, mm -hmm. and we cannot ever get rid of them. Right. So we have four commercial music channels that we inherited as part of the merger. Um, and you can imagine our programmers, how thrilled they are with that. And that's mm -hmm. because, was that, that was just something they I was grandfathered in, in from the XM deal. Okay. So when XM needed financing, they made a deal with Clear Channel for financing, and part of the deal was you gotta give us four slots. And they put on Well, the how does that benefit them? Well, I would imagine if you're Elvis Duran on Z100 Morning Zoo, that you now can say I'm available anywhere in the right, continental okay. United States, well, anywhere in the United States and North America. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I guess for advertising too. It's a, it's a little thing I, they can tell their advertising. I suppose, I hope not, but yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? How about the program? You used the word programmers a couple times and, and the way the music is curated. Uh, who, who is doing for the spectrum? You know, what kind of channel is that? What kind of person is programming? What is the background of that person? That kind of thing. Um, the spectrum is, by the industry, called uh, an adult alternative AAA station. It's really not because it's radically different from many, although that whole niche of AAA is very much diverse. Um, it's programmed by a young woman. She's in her 30s. Her name is Jessica. Um, she grew up there, started as a coordinator and was mentored. And uh, she reports to somebody who makes sure what he agrees with everything she's doing. And um, it's a channel that mixes classic rock and some of the contemporary new music. So it's for, you know, a person who is still passionate about music but wants to hear some of their favorite old songs but they also would like to hear something new. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the background, the musical background of that kind of person, not as a player but I always go back to Questlove. Do you understand, you know, Questlove who's the drummer for The Roots and I've, in a couple classes I've brought this up before. Questlove blows me away because he knows everything about every style of music. He knows every person yeah. who played on that record. He's just obsessed with music and everything about it and every genre well, and he's a DJ and he'll go out and he'll do private parties and, and you know put all that stuff together and then come back and play on Jimmy Fallon's band. So I'll you give know. you the example. Um, the guy who programs the Sinatra channel, the 50s channel and the 60s channel and the new channel we just launched Velvet. Um, so he does those four channels. He's based in LA, works out of his house, his name is Lou Simon and he will come to New York and he and I can have ridiculous conversations 
where he'll tell me the color of the label, the B-side, and just ridiculous amounts of minutia. He's now doing the Billy Joel channel, so that's his fifth channel, and he goes out to Billy's house and they talk about songs, and he can just pick up on anything. You know, Billy's talking about, he's doing a show, I don't think it's aired yet, um, his favorite Long Island bands when he was growing up. So, you know, it's bands like, I'm sorry, I'm talking, sounds like an archeologist here. Uh, he talks about the Vagrants, which was uh, Leslie West's mm -hmm. first band. Or he talks about the Young Rascals, or he talks about that hair band, The Illusion. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and Luke can just go, oh yeah, they were on Steed, and it was a gray label, and the B-side was, and he just, I mean, he just knows that stuff, it's scary. And then he'll just, he can segue into the Sinatra channel and talk about all those standards music, and he knows all that stuff too. And he's just, I mean, there's, there's a couple of guys like that that just, the guy who programs the Love Channel, I mean, he'll just come to my office and just throw some random song title at me that he thinks fits the moment. And, you know, he knows I'm probably the only other person in the building who would appreciate that ridiculous sense of humor. And then Cousin Brucey has a young woman working for him who just graduated college. Um, she lives in Staten Island. And you swear there's like a 55-year-old midget inside of her because she knows every oldie song. She knows the B-side. Her favorite thing is she sits at her desk all day listening to the box tops cry like a baby sung in Italian. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's just like, and you can't stump her. She knows all these things, all these bands. I mean, I was like, how does she know these things? I mean, she wasn't even alive. But she's like a cultural, like, bizarro. She was making fun of today, somebody. She said, um, do you believe Mike doesn't know who Mo Howard is? Anybody here know who Mo Howard is? Yeah, she was making fun of this guy. Now, here she is. She's like uh, 22 years old and making fun of one of the guys who's in his late 20s to know Mo Howard. Mo Howard was Mo, real name from the Three Stooges. She says, I, I can't believe you didn't know that. I mean, so that, I mean, it's like she's an idiot savant knowing all this pop culture minutia. And I think that's more important than knowing the music. It's knowing the pop, the pop culture that surrounds that. We've got a guy programming the 40s channel named Human Newman. And he just knows all those big band names and all those musicians. And, and he's familiar with that era. Um, and then he can segue to the 70s channel, which he also programs. So, you know, but they know the context and they know the era and, you know, what was important. He's, Tom Jones was in uh, promoting his new album and he was talking about his appearance on Ed Sullivan and how that same day the Stones, Rolling Stones were on, they sang, I forget what song it was, and Lou said to him, no, 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 the Stones sang As Tears Go By on that show. He goes, no, they sang, he goes, no, on that show, <laughs> he says, the other show they sang, and he was correcting Tom Jones because he remembered what song the Stones does. And he, he loves going through rock books and picking out the mistakes. <laughs> and he's like, he goes, how can they publish that book? He goes, that information's wrong. Mm. So we have people yeah. like that. Then you have people who are just, you know, very passionate and, and fans of the genre. So um, there's a, the, the Loft is programmed by a guy named Mike Marone down in D.C., and he... He's, he's got every record. You know, he, he wanted, he, his favorite thing is he plays guest DJ with the, with the celebrities. So he had Robert Plant on and playing, called Playing Favorites. And Robert's, oh, I got some stuff he'll never play. He'll never have it. And he, and he knew and he pulled it up and he had it. And it was just like. Mm -hmm. so. My last thing is um, you were in a class a couple years ago. You were our uh, executive in residence, basically, what, is that what we call it? For expert. Uh, expert in residence for the music management program. And you uh, sat in a class, you sat behind the desk, you started asking the, the, everybody in the class, all right, what was the number one movie last week? What was the number one TV show? Uh, what was the number one song? And they're sort of trivial things, but your point goes off of what you just said a second about, go about the culture, understanding not just music, but the culture at the time. Could you Kind of I believe if you want to get in the business and be successful, whether you're going to work for the man or work for yourself, you're in the pop culture business. So I don't care if you're in a jazz combo or you're a magic country artist or you're a DJ doing you know, some EDM remixes. You got to know what's going on in the market. If you don't know what the public is consuming and what, you know, I'll even throw in books. What's, you know, what, what's, you know, what's the top nonfiction or what's top fiction? You gotta know what's going on. You, got, you gotta know how big Star Wars was and you gotta know what 
artist knocked Adele at a number one on the album charts. I'm not saying you'd be a chart idiot. I'm just saying, you, you know, it doesn't cost anything to go on the internet and look up on the Billboard charts. And if you don't want to look at that, go to hitsdailydouble.com and you can read what the most best-selling, the most downloaded music. Um, I think you got to know that stuff. To that end, I, I, I still do it. I don't know why. But I, I have a blog that I just curate. So I don't comment. It's not me to comment. I guess indirectly it's a comment by what's posted there. But I will find an article that I think is of interest to somebody who wants to be in the music business. And so rather than me doing Blackboard, I thought that might be an easier um, thing for me and maybe for some students. So you're familiar with the Now series, the compilations, I would assume? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, so there was an article in, in one of the um, on the internet somewhere, I don't know where, I don't remember where I got it from, but I put that up, I put, pasted that up there about how that came into being, the, the Now series, because mm -hmm. it started in England and came over here. So, um, you know, important stuff like that, or at least what I think is important. So, okay, some of you might say it's just cocktail talk, you know, that you can use at a bar, you know, rather than asking what your sign is or whatever. But I think it's more important than that. I think you've got to know the marketplace and what's going on. And you got to know your customer, and the customer is the general population. So if you don't know what's at the box office, and if you don't know what people are reading, and what the most popular car that people drive, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how you function or how you can be successful. And I always tell people you're competing with people. And so what access to information is the commodity that separates you from the next person. So if you're competing for the same job or, or competing for the same position with an artist or something, you, you have the edge by saying, well, you know, your song was used in that movie, and that movie was, uh, you know, was very successful last week. It was number two at the box office. I mean, all the information is there, and um, I'm not saying you have to be a student of it, but I think you should be. Well, I, I think more importantly, you've got to want to know this stuff. I mean, I think no. if you just think you're going to float, and you really don't have an interest in all of this as a pop culture, then it's going to be difficult to be hired. Uh, if you want to be hired. If you want to be hired, of course. I keep which, saying I don't think that's the end game anymore. Right. But for some people it might be. Which brings me to my last question, which nobody has asked, and that is uh, serious radio internships. So our department have three interns every semester. But due to the wonderful uh, legal system we have in the lawsuits, unlike Condé Nast, which has eliminated their uh, internship programs, we still have our inter internship program. But instead of us having three, we have one. Mm. And everyone, this is, everyone gets paid, can't work more than 20 hours a week. Um, and to be an intern, you have to go through a background check, which I was told costs money. So they do a background check on anybody who's an intern, and then you, if you're fortunate enough to get that internship. So it's a pity and it's a shame that it's come down to that, because I always used to say in these kinds of settings, like internship, internship, because it's the only way you're going to learn. It's the only way. Classroom knowledge will only get you so far when you're there and next to somebody who's doing it. You go, oh, the light bulb goes off. I mean, I, if, I didn't, if I wasn't fortunate enough to work with somebody like Murray the K, I, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I mean, people teach you things along the way as an intern or even as an employee. I, I learn stuff every day, and you, you keep that in the back of your brain. I, when I was working in Atlantic, I was on the road with a, a singer who's unfortunately not around, it, Kenny Rankin. Mm. Kenny had a substance abuse count problem um, for years, but he cleaned himself up. And we were in, of all places, Kansas City. And he said to me, you know, Steve, I learned one thing as a junkie. You always tell the truth. That way you don't have to keep your story straight. Mm -hmm. And I never, I never, ever forgot that. And when I got to see him one night in Florida several years ago, I said, you don't know me. No, I don't know. I said, well, I was your promotion guy at Atlanta. Oh, yeah. Well. I said, he's taught me something. He says, I did? I told him that. He goes, I said that? I said, mm -hmm. I said, yes, you did say that. 
<laughs> and I always keep that. So I think you learn stuff along the way. And if I wasn't on the road in Kansas City with Kenny Rankin, I wouldn't have known that. And that's kind of helped me along the way. It's like, you know, you don't have to worry about forgetting or keeping your story straight. You go, well, the truth is, and then, mm -hmm. so um, that's why I say internships, um, if you can get in the right one, the right place. And that's serious, you go through HR? You have to apply online, and then you have to torture the HR people. That's mm -hmm. the other thing. You got to have the eye of the tiger. Metaphor from, from early Rocky film. If you want to do something, you got to do it. You can't say, I want to. You have to go and get it. I, I, yeah, I, I'm interviewing a couple of part-time people for this nocturnal position. And I am shocked. I only got, I think I talked to six people. I got two thank you emails. Now it's been a month. And I just realized today, not one of them has followed up saying, hey, what's the status? What's going on? And it bums me out. I'm like, I really want this job, but you haven't been torturing me. Because if I wanted a job, I would be driving that person nuts. Because I know I drive people nuts trying to get stuff done with you know, celebrities and artists. I, don't, you know, I become a real pain in the ass. I, you know, I just, if the answer is no, I accept no. But if, and, 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 but if I don't get an answer, it drives me batty. Okay, so Dave, oh, there is a question. A few. I actually had this question. 11th hour. I had this question before, and it was weird that you kind of brought it up. Um, there's kind of a bit of controversy going around about studying music business as a major at college. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, so I was like, it's, it's funny because you, you didn't study any of this like we're doing now. Like, this is kind of like a, a relatively new thing to be going to college and university and being in an MBA program to study music business and management. So what's your take on that side of learning things? Well, let me clarify one thing first, that I would never... I would never run a Masters of Music Business program. It would, you have an MBA, so it's a legitimate MBA, and then your concentration is music business. You have a Bachelor of Music, and your concentration is music management. Or you have a Bachelor of Arts, and your concentration is pop music or whatever. And that's different than being a Bachelor of Pop Music. Or about, so, at a university, we're fortunate enough to give you a real, well-rounded education. And if you choose to be <clears throat> in the entertainment business, then we hope you get a leg ahead. But 10 years from now, if you're not in the entertainment business, you still have an MBA, or you still have a, a Bachelor of Music, or you still have a BA. And I think that's different than the way the trade schools treat it, such as a full sale or something like that, even though they call it Bachelor of Arts and so on. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, th I think you're naive if you don't take at least a secondary major or um, focus on another area as well. Because as a friend of mine just pointed out, he said the skill set you have is not readily transferable. That's for somebody in my age group or my peers. So if you are majoring as you are, and I would say focus also on getting a, a, a strong background in business. Mm -hmm. Because I think just, you know, well, it, it, he, it's, it's, he, listen, he articulated it probably much better than I can, but I think you need to have a strong background in something else so you have a, a fallback position, A, and B, you can bring to the table something else that somebody who just came out of full sale and like, I have a degree in music business. Because there is a concern that many schools are now offering because it's a sexy major. Same thing's gonna happen right now with sports management. All of a sudden, that's the hot major. And it's like, I, I don't know if there's enough sports players out there that need managers or people. Um, so I think you take your passion and love for something but combine it with something else that's practical so you have a fallback or that something that complements that. So I didn't have the, well, I, did, I didn't take a music business 
situation. I have radio, TV, film, which is even more weird. What the hell do you do with that? I mean, I, you know, okay, I got a master's degree, I guess I can teach somewhere. But I don't know, I don't know what the practical application of that is. So I wish I had spent more time, you know, in, I mean, I did take basic business law, but I would say, suggest that would be, I mean, if I could do it over again, I'd probably rather get an MBA, although there's a lot of MBAs running around unemployed. So the answer is focus on what you want, but also find something that's practical that you can also know that you can use. If, I hope that sort of helps. No, that's great. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, anyone else? <coughs> That's good. Rude. Okay, so I just realized when you said that, like, mostly men subscribe, is that because, like, I just know my mom and a lot of my friends' moms, like, they all drive cars that are registered under, like, their dad's name. So it's like, is that how you're getting that information, seeing who the car is registered to? I, I think, I th maybe, but I think more importantly is a lot of the programming is so test testosterone-led. I mean, yeah, we have, we have a weekly show for moms. We have kind of a Radio Cosmo show, but most of our programming is so chauvinistic. It's so um, male-oriented. The sports are all male-oriented. Um, Howard Stern is for women, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Mm. Um, I was just surprised because I know mostly, like, girls listen to it, not so well, much. Well, it's good. I, that, that, that's good to hear. Um, I just know that there's always been a concern internally is finding more programming that might appeal to women. And most of it we've failed terribly with Oprah uh, and Martha Stewart. Not, maybe those aren't the right female, you know, in 2016 or 2015 when they were around, uh, a female-oriented programming. But I think there's a, I mean, I think we have a, a niche there that needs to be filled. That's my personal opinion. And I know the company is aware that it's a very male-dominated situation. Thank you. Well, Good point, thank you.